hi everyone. So today's panel will focus on understanding shifting preferences in the grocery, grocery retail space and effectively understanding how organizations adapt and align their business operations to changing preferences. So in a rapidly uh, changing consumer environment, identifying shifts in preferences is imperative and critical to stay competitive in the market. And I'd like to start our conversation with Ashutosh. And to understand from you as an introduction to, to this panel, what are the key trends shaping uh, uh, consumer behavior and shopping habits in the grocery retail space? OK. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thank you, Santhia, for the uh, question. Uh, I think consumer habits is a very complex uh, subject when it comes to uh, this market. Um, so we already have two types of uh, consumers. Uh, there's the resident consumer, and there is the short-stay customer or uh, tourist. And these customers are divided into 200 different nationalities. So when you multiply those, you actually have 400 different consumer preferences to uh, uh, look at. However, having said that, uh, we put this into three uh, major uh, buckets. So we classify them under one being a conscious uh, consumer, then the second being the creator's economy, which is driven by a uh, consumer. And the third trend is the value for uh, value. So speaking about the conscious uh, uh, consumer, so in the earlier days, uh, consumer was more worried about uh, what he eats. He was more worried about uh, things that matter to him uh, directly. So organic food, uh, gluten-free uh, food, sugar-free food were more important. Now, those categories are growing. Uh, in fact, you know, we, are, we have a partner here sitting uh, from uh, Musgrave from Ireland, and they have a fantastic uh, range of uh, organic produce under the super value uh, range. And we have worked very hard together to get that range in our stores. And it will be, soon hit our stores uh, this week and will be available for our consumers. However, the other trend that is coming out is how the consumer lives, what is his lifestyle, and what are the things that matter to them as a, in their external environment. So it's things related to sustainability. Now, does the brand or the banner also live to the same values? So that's one preference that we see becoming stronger and stronger. The second one is the creator's uh, economy, uh, which is driven by consumers and, and which is extremely interesting and vast. So earlier, the brand's perception and positioning would be decided by the marketing campaigns uh, that they would uh, do. But today, a brand's perception and positioning is also defined by what ratings and reviews that they are getting in the various social media platforms. And the weightage of that is increasing more and more. And which is also making customers switch from one brand to another easily because they are getting highly influenced by what is happening in the social media uh, space. The last trend is the value for value. Now, when, when the word value comes up, we think it's all about pricing. However, the consumers are not looking at just pricing. They do need pricing but they need that in specific categories. So if I want to buy a detergent or a floor peener, I will want the lowest price product. Yeah, I may not be so brand conscious. But when it comes to my yogurts, cheese, and other products, I don't mind paying for, uh, paying for the experience and the differentiation uh, that the brand offers. So these are the three trends that we see that you know, are changing rapidly or getting a larger uh, weightage in the consumer shopping habits. And consumer trends are ever-changing, so it's continuously updating uh, over the years. How do you spot the new trends, and how do you predict future trends using your tools, analytics, and so on? So largely two sources. One is external. Now, that's what we depend upon a, a lot in terms of the future trends. So if it's too past in the future, then it's obviously social media from where we get it. But more closer to the uh, timeline, most of our trends we get from our, our supplier partners because they invest a lot in the, in the research and development of products and through their category management programs, they give us a quick view onto what things are going to uh, happen. 
A lot of trains also come through our market visits, whether it's the competition store, whether it's Giant or F Mart or even Nesto, or even the international uh, stores that we, uh, that we visit. However, one thing that is important, you know, when you spot this trend through all these external resources, it's very critical that you map this or value this, uh, the, these uh, insights that you are getting through your own internal data. Because many times this trends can be for a short period. It's like, if I have to give an example of uh, a prime drink, it was a, a big uh, trend a couple of uh, months back. You know, it went like this and, and then kind of came down and, and has a, a plateaued. So you need to spot which is a fad, a short term trend, and which is a long term trend. So maybe not to, uh, not to uh, uh, new, but free range eggs is one thing that came in and stayed now for, uh, for generations. So you need to kind of measure the trend that you are getting with data. Again, you can use external data from external agencies as well, and then map your strategies around it. That's clear. And um, Manish, actually, from your perspective as well. We got less seats, so we got to share. <laughs> so, so from your perspective as well, uh, many grocery retailers, they look at historical sales trends to predict future sales, and which can be limiting in many aspects. So from your perspective as well in Aswak and Jayon, how do you leverage tools, analytics as well, and what has been proven to be most effective in understanding and predicting future trends? Thank you. Um, before I start off, um, a bit about Giant and Aspark. The upper hand we have, we've got a distribution, we've got manufacturing, and we've got retailing across various arms, right? So we've got tools which have been existing within the business for a pretty long time across different verticals. Historical data actually helps you build the foundation because I don't think that the core is going to change. The contribution between the categories across stores have been more or less consistent. It helps you build a foundation, but in order to forecast um, how analytics is going to help us is understanding first is your inventory planning, right? Because pre-season, in-season, and post-season is the most critical factor. How you buy, how you sell, and then how you make sure you're profitable. So demand planning is something that we work with. There's a, there's a tool um, where we've tried and tested it in the other verticals. We work with O9 on that. Now, when you buy the product, how you present it in the shop floor, because you bought it with a certain logic, and the customer shop with a certain consumer journey. So that's how um, we mock it or planogram it within the store. And in order to make every single square meter profitable, because we work on wafer thin margins and um, the rents are, it is, and to ultimately become profitable, space planning comes in uh, hand in hand because we need to measure every single thing that we put in every single aisle, whether it's working, whether it's right for them from a consumer journey point of view, and whether it's selling. So absolutely measuring shelf life from the time we buy the product till we sell the product to the end consumer. And again, you've got multiple other analytics from how you make sure you've got your um, inventory data right in your point of sale system. So that, I think, is um, how we're looking at historical data, building a foundation, and how we're scaling up with the analytics that we have. OK, clear. Um, and from your perspective as well, are there any differences in consumer trends and shopping habits between the online channel and the offline channel? And what are they, mainly? I think that's a bit difficult to answer. <laughs> Because online customer needs speed, uh, the offline customer needs an experience. Online customer needs value. That means how can we get them at the best price, get them quickly. That means the cost of acquiring a customer in an online channel may be quicker, but a lower basket spend. But to retain that customer, we have to get cheaper and get a lot more efficient to deliver that product, right? Uh, and a seamless consumer journey on the online platform. Whereas on, on the offline platform, you've got a higher basket spend because you've got an experience that the customer is going to get into. Um, he reacts or she reacts or, or the consumer reacts 
uh, a lot more on promotion. They're not very price sensitive, to your point. If, if I would see a cheese online, I'd say, hmm, I'd buy the regular one. But if I do see um, a product presentation or a, a bit of theater around the product, I might as well spend twice the money on it. So, sorry, go ahead, sorry, sorry. Sorry, just to add to what uh, Mishu was saying is that I think uh, the online customer is also ready to pay much more than what the offline is. And we, we see consumers coming in and comparing prices in an offline brick, brick and mortar store, and he's ready to pay a 10% more as delivery charge, yeah, based on his average uh, basket size when he's buying from the convenience of his house. So he's actually shopping with two different uh, temperaments. Yeah? And the online consumer tends to repeat the same purchase. Uh, even, even the apps make them do that. You know, you'll have your most frequently bought products uh, right at the top. Whereas an offline brick customer, he likes experimenting. So when we do differentiation, it benefits a consumer who's coming in the store rather than he's, when he's buying it online. I would also like to add one thing because I'm a predominantly e-commerce platform, okay. organic and real. <laughs> What my feeling is that I'm into a specialty food business, the kind of offerings that we will be able to offer in an online store is impossible to put it on a shelf. For example, in one category, gluten-free bread. In online, I'll be able to offer them 15 different SKUs, 15 brands, each brand will be having 10 SKUs. We are talking about 25, 30. It is impossible to put it on a shelf. The cons consumers will have the option to choose what exactly they want, then the trend, what happens is many, many a time the customers see the particular product online, go to the store, check it over there, open the, the phone, check the prices online, then take a decision. If the price difference is marginal, then they take a decision whichever way. If the price difference is huge, then it's a it's very different uh, buying decision. Also, if the products are not easily available, for example, some of the premium products are available only in Jumeirah area. Somebody who is staying in Al Khavanij is very difficult to find the same kind of product in any of the stores around it. They are ready to buy, paying 20 dirhams delivery charge for the same product. We sell 5 dirham item with customers paying 25 dirhams delivery charges. So that is something irrational. But that is how the consumer be behavior is. True, true. One more thing, I think. Um, while you said the consumer is going to come back into the store, the same logic goes to fresh produce. For me to buy fresh produce, I need to touch and feel the product. Because for me, it's still, somebody else is going to pick it up and bring it. No matter what the price is, the physical touch is still going to, to be very important, even for the gluten-free range. So, yeah. Thank you for that. And speaking of actually uh, limited shelf space, so, Hamad, my question to you on this. As consumers are um, interested in um, larger breadth of offerings and in a more diverse product range. How do you manage an F-Mart between offering that, offering a larger variety, but still managing that within a, a, sh a smaller shelf space? Thank you for the question. Yeah, uh, F-Mart is basically trying to be present in all uh, premium communities and luxury towers all the time. And uh, this is a very big challenge for us. Like, you know, we have seen the shift in cons consumer behavior from, like, I'm traditionally from here. I'm brought up in uh, Dibba, Fujera. So that, my dad has a 50-year-old supermarket chain. So over there, the trend used to be the customers come and sit down with the owners, have a personal discussion. You know their son, their son. So you have a complete knowledge of who's born in the family and what is needed. From there, we have moved to an era where the technology tells you that, you know, uh, which your pampers should be sent as an advertisement to a customer who lives in that apartment. You know, the, the first year you send number one and the third year, the, your system should be pushing this. So, in all together, what we feel now, we have a very limited shelf space in all our stores, reason being we're convenience stores and technology plays a vital role in helping us to or uh, make sure we keep the right set of products. And we do rotating of products to understand how consumers' behavior changes and to evaluate if there is any further changes needed to that. And apart from that, we do regular consumer feedback sessions to understand, like, you know, we have, 
even tailor made four different concepts for UAE in our uh, business model to make sure we cater to different types of consumers, though they are office going customers or residential people or tourists. So even after categorizing, we still feel there is more technological advancement needed in order for us to address the growing demands. Because Dubai is a place where we have almost 200 nationalities living in. And there are many companies which is like Transmit or, you know, these companies play a vital role for us to be ensuring multinational products are available in this, uh, in our stores. So all together, it's a challenge, but uh, we are tackling it in the best manner, even with the help of technology, with the internal data analysis, and with the feedback mechanisms. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. I have a question, if that's okay. Um, while you segment your four concepts, are they... Um, of course, they're going to be segmented from a product and a pricing standpoint. Yes. How much difference do you think that applies to categories? So, Sorry? So, while you differentiate your concepts mm -hmm. uh, based on assortment right. and pricing. Right. Correct? Yeah. There is more uh, reason for us to categorize it. Initially, what we have is like four different concepts, like FMR Swift, uh, Select, Boutique and Express. So Express caters to places like metro stations or high footfall locations like we are present in the Sheikh Zayed Mosque in Abu Dhabi where the footfall is almost 30,000 per day. So to cater to very high footfall, high traffic locations, we have a concept where we will have a small little cafe and then we have fast consumed products. And then uh, we have a concept which is like boutique, which we've launched inside the Star Hotel lobbies. So that is something which we are very passionate about, uh, you know, to... Dubai is a place where a lot of people are coming here to become the millionaire. So we want to be that place where millionaires can come and shop. Or like, you know, the hotel lobbies or, you know, premium luxury towers. That's one place we are aspiring to be and we have uh, launched three of our outlets in there. And we're trying to expand that furthermore. So the categorization is basically based on the customer profile and the population, whether it is, is it like office going customers or residential customers. And it has worked out well for us in the past years and hoping to grow further. I hope I answered. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So what I'd like to explore next is transforming insights into actions and effectively understanding how your businesses adapt their supply chains, their business operations to these new trends that we've spotted. And I'd like to start here the conversation with Rashid and to understand uh, once we've identified a new consumer trend, how does your organization react in terms of adapting your business model, your products to, to that trend specifically? Okay, well, uh, thank you. See, in the uh, beginning, it said, uh, Ashutosh uh, said very clearly on this, uh, we will be mapping the demand initially. Uh, it will be based on uh, what the customer preference is whether it is uh, long term or else like short term. First priority from our end, it will be uh, for our local partners. So we will be checking the availability with them. So if that doesn't work or else like if our market research is having, if there seems like there is an opportunity in this product range and all, we would definitely choose direct imports. Uh, right now, we are doing uh, from 61 uh, countries direct sourcing. If the product demand is stable, so definitely to avoid the middleman and to get the product in a better price and to make this product available in a better quality, which we can monitor, we will prefer to choose the product directly. Uh, through our own channel itself. Then the third step will be, we will try to create private labels in this. Uh, Nesto, everyone knows we are strong enough in the private label categories which we are catering around 25 to 30 percentage of our products uh, in private label. That's in different brand name. Maybe you could feel those brands as an international brands itself. Uh, we are not entertaining the brands in our name uh, under Nesto. I think many of the retailers are using the same strategies now. That's it for uh, onboarding new products. It's purely uh, based on the demand mapping. And 
generally with supply chain costs increasing, labor costs increasing, and also raw material, how are you navigating these challenges? See, if uh, raw materials are increasing, definitely uh, the product price for all the brands are increasing. See, for a short time, everyone will uh, check to get an alternative option. If nothing is working, okay, the retail pricing is obviously shifting to the, as per the market standard. Now, uh, we can just check the examples when UAE government adopt tax, excess tax on uh, hydration, uh, hydrated drink, then energy drink and all. In the first year, everyone over here, uh, retailers, they are ha not having that much sales and all. Now everyone, every customers, they know the price won't be changing. So they are shifting from that perception to this. So they were getting uh, Dew or Fanda or Pepsi for uh, one dirham. That is shifted to two dirham, three dirham. In that sense, uh, they are well informed now, but it will take a time. It, uh, more or less, it will be like six, seven months. Uh, the customer preference will be changing in those periods. Thank you for that. And effectively speaking again, or going back to the subject of consumers wanting more fresh products and uh, healthier products, there's a growing demand for um, sustainable, locally sourced uh, products, which may not be always available and may, which may not always be cost effective as well. So I'd like to understand in organic and real specifically, how are you managing your supply chains in that regard? See, when I started the business in 2018, I started it as an exclusive organic online store. The main reason being, I believe that organic food is something that everybody should be consuming. It should not be a, a choice of choosing a conventional or, a, or an or, organic one. So I jumped into the, the business and now I completed six to seven years. I realized the challenges are plenty because during this phase of almost six to seven years, I've seen almost a dozen companies with a similar concept dying in front of me. We survived. The reason being, the product, even though it's a concept that is good for the health, there is a fine line between the value that we will be able to offer in the form of organic, certified organic, and the price the consumers are ready to pay. For example, in 2018, when we started the business, the annual growth of uh, organic food produced globally was almost like 23 percentage CAGR. It was like growing in five years, you're more than doubling the business. But then COVID hit. Once the COVID hit, everybody's sitting at home. Then their revenue came down. Then it, it was kind of confusing because they want to increase their immunity level by consuming healthy food, which is organic but they don't have enough money to pay for organic. So it was kind of a conf conf confusing scenario. So uh, brands like us tried to figure out a, a balanced way by managing the supply chain, by bringing the products in a bulk level, because these, the products that I sell, it may not be easily available in any of their stores, because they are mainly into conventional products, which they are selling it on, I mean, like multiple uh, containers on a daily basis. I'm selling on pallets. But I offer 5,000 plus varieties of organic, vegan, gluten-free, keto, which are supposed to be healthy. So these are the products which I'm trying to bring it to the consumers at an affordable price by managing the PSI, purchase sales inventory, in a proper way. But the challenge is always there, and I believe we are in the process of shifting from organic to a standard consumption of healthy food. We call it as a real food. So certified, certified organic is something that everybody is believing into. But the thing is that a lot of consumers are not really actually believing that the organic food is uh, healthier than the, the conventional one. They always think, then what is the difference? It's the same. My father and my grandfather used to have the same conventional one. They are happy. But they are not realizing the kind of farming practices that is changed right now, the kind of pesticides and the chemicals which is being added on to the multi-crop uh, culture, uh, the, the farming practice at the moment right now, which is having an impact on the body and the diseases also. So slowly and slowly, we are trying to create awareness, trying to make the product available at 
affordable price also. So consumers are slowly and steadily are switching towards healthier side. Just to give an example, a conventional egg, one egg would be costing less than a, one dirham, right? But if an organic egg is, is selling at 3 to 3.5 dirhams, just imagine the difference in price. It is not 10, 20 percent, it is two and a half to three times. That has to come down. So people like us, FMART, everyone are looking into working on, uh, on the value chain and the supply chain to reduce that particular cost by working closely with the farmers and also reducing the supply chain and the value chain uh, inefficiencies at the moment right now. Are prices actually, do you see over the time that prices are going down or are they continuously on the rise? The prices are going down. The prices are going down. Another factor that is happening right now is when this, everybody is identifying organic food as a trend, so many farmers are getting into the organic food. But then the challenges comes into the uh, picture because they're farming, their land can only be certified as organic only after three years of no farming practices. That is the first challenge. Then the certification process is changing in a very big way. It is becoming more expensive. Now we are coming up with a new concept called real food, which is certified organic quality, but without the certification, much affordable price. And that is where we are in the process of educating the customers, creating awareness, and the large volume of our customer database. We are trying to use them as the ambassadors because they have the experience of buying good quality of food from us. And then we work with the farmers and try to make it available to the customers also. And it's becoming more available in the UAE and uh, in Saudi in general, in this region, where there are a lot of sustainable farms, especially from a fruit and vegetable perspective. So it is becoming maybe more accessible, but generally there's still some pressure from supply chains as well. Yes, very true, very true. For example, in UAE, there are more than 100 organic farms. It's unbelievable. But the thing is that the kind of um, support that the, the, the industry is giving to those farms to make their products available on the shelf at an affordable price is, is it's quite challenging at the moment. For example, Emirates Biofarm, they must be here somewhere. They, I'm, I've been talking to them also, it's quite challenging over there. But that is the way to go. Because organic food is not only for the health, it is for the planet also. That farming practice is something which heals the planet. The topsoil which is being damaged by the, the monocrop which is, has, has happened, that can only be reversed by using uh, the multi-crop farming methodologies, which is adopted by the organic uh, producers. And in general, um, partnerships are always strategic to also expand your market, expand your uh, product offerings. So what has been uh, effective so far in the partnerships that you seek, uh, that you sought in the past or you are seeking in the future as well? Innovation and technology from a food point of view food point of view is, is something which is not really connected. It is all there in the supply chain or other production processing level. We are now taking the initiative of introducing an AI-based blockchain framework of solution to bring the real food into the market at the moment right now. So there is a partner that we are working with. He's a consultant based out of UK. It's called Management. They are now working very closely with us to identify the global scenarios of how the potential of the real food is there. And also we are coming up with a solution which is next level of AI. It's not chat GPT, the next level which is, which is RAG AI. So we are working on the RAG AI with a blockchain uh, technology framework where the traceability is there for the consumers to find out, okay fine, if I'm telling that this particular product is a real product, it doesn't have the organic certification, they will be able to find the traceability from which farm, where is it coming up. That kind of an infrastructure is something that we are working with management at the moment right now. And I believe that is where we are pioneering on, on making a tech innovation in the, in the food industry. That's clear. And um, Mohammed, so I'd like to also maybe explore the same subject in terms of strategic supplier partnerships that you're making to enhance uh, your uh, product quality or expansion in and, and any ways. Right. Uh, con like you said, considering the type of locations where we are presented, it's very important we have uh, availability of multinational products or like, you know, from different countries because we serve to a lot of tourist customers as well. And uh, our supply chain, which is available in Dubai, which helps us to cater to vast majority, 
and uh, we have our in-house uh, AI and database analysis which we conduct based on the consumer preferences which help us to make a decision about what assortment should be filled in each of our concept. And uh, apart from these uh, strategic decisions based on you know consumer preferences, feedbacks, that is what is helping us to uh, engage with customers on a long run and be sure that they are finding their needs from our stores. Like, you know, and uh, there are uh, suppliers like Alakad or, you know, Let's Organic or a few brands and we are yet to maybe join hands together for more engagements to, you know, venture out together. And there are few major names like Transmed and Alakad, which I would like to mention, which is helping our supply chain to make sure we have all the uh, most important or most uh, recognized or required products available in our stores. Thank you. That's clear. Anything different in Nesto or in Choi Thrones? Right now, uh, we are not into online channel. So, uh, I have some questions with them. Uh, see, uh, when we are doing uh, online grocery business, uh, we came to understand, we were having a platform before, uh, during the COVID time, but uh, we wind up because of operational issues and all. Where you are uh, lacking the uh, threat, like uh, where you are having the difficulties in the sense, like supply chain management or else like uh, product assortments or sourcing, were uh, the online groceries having more threats? See, if we are only in the online business, we have the mechanism to figure out solutions for all these challenges. These are the challenges which will be there in any online business. That is the reason why Amazon is never successful in a brick and mortar and uh, the other like uh, huge retail stores are not into online. Even Lulu also started their online, but I don't think it is successful. Amazon, you know, like consumed it already. So being into online business, supply chain solutions, consumer understanding, last mile delivery, LMD is, is a huge challenge. These are all the daily issues that we, we try to manage more than the product sourcing, more than the product availability and everything. Because once we identify the product, we specialize in certain product categories, we know the suppliers, that is one category, one segment which keeps on coming to us. Because our volumes are not as huge as the retail stores. You guys are doing huge business. We are not into that much of huge business. So we will be able to manage the product and the, and the, uh, the volumes in a better way. What we need to figure out is how the customer experience of the buying, the delivery, the, the belief in the product that they saw as a picture and what they received as a, as a consumer, is it the same or not? This is something that continuously we need to, we need to manage it. Because, see, unlike in, in retail stores, what happens is by any chance, if I do something wrong because of the delivery of that particular product also next morning google review one star rating with a good bashing that is a standard for us it never happens with you because consumers are online when they buy the products from us so we need to be extremely careful in the complete supply chain experience of the customers in buying process last mile delivery also when we done this exercise before uh, we were lacking the impulse buying from our stores. So uh, whenever we are doing some promotions in online only, uh, the traffic we could see. So uh, we didn't uh, get that much results uh, when we did uh, before two years. So we are not into online platform now. So I got some information from uh, these guys. So let's check uh, in future what can be done. I think this whole thing about online, you know, the brick and the click uh, gets spoken about a, a lot. I think there's one thing that's definitely going to be there, that the bricks are not going to go away because of the clicks. You know, as bricks, we are a, more than a hundred year old industry. In my view, uh, clicks started post-COVID. You know, they were an insignificant portion of our business before 2020 and now uh, the, the clicks is becoming a, a significant double digit. Uh, contribution. Both are going to stay. Consumers are going to use both the channels and their shopping is going to be differentiated where they might continue to do their uh, monthly baskets and pantry loading uh, through the, the BRICS channel and their top-ups to the, uh, the clicks channel. Uh, but that's not only how a consumer differentiates. I think 
you also differentiates uh, on the basis of what brands are sold by a by a, a retailer, uh, what is the format that he is uh, in. Means uh, today the market is getting extremely competitive. Means I open one store and Giant will open a store next to me, and F Mart again next to a uh, to a Giant. So in that scenario, if you don't have a differentiation in assortment, yeah, it's going to be very difficult to survive. So we at Choitrams have tied up with two wonderful brands, one from uh, Ireland, uh, Super Value, and the second from UK, uh, Sainsbury's. Uh, then this is also about the formats, means everybody can't keep on opening just hypermarkets, means there is only that much that any country can take in terms of the number of hypermarkets because they are really huge boxes. So you need to innovate on the formats as well. And then you also need to differentiate on your social uh, delivery, you know, what you give back to the, uh, 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 to the consumer. So, you know, we, we ran a campaign uh, called Bring It Back above for plastic bottles. And there was a huge engagement and we managed to collect around 40,000 uh, bottles. So that engagement is with your consumers, with your community is extremely important for the differentiation as well. Thank you, Ashutosh. So uh, last but not least, I'd like to also explore um, from as consumer preferences evolve, so does the need to create engaging space, spaces and uh, uh, creating social spaces that meet uh, consumers' expectations. So I'd like to discuss with you, Muhammad, as well, understanding from the real estate industry, how are you creating spaces that meet uh, consumers' preferences and from a retailer perspective, also, also from a grocery retail perspective, uh, their expectations? First of all, good evening, everybody. I think it's 4.30. So it will be nice to, to shut quickly. Uh, if, you, if we consider the evaluation of the shopping uh, path and trend from the history, where people, they used to be on the big soups, everything together, to the specialized soups, soup for gold, soup for clothes, soup for food, to modern shopping mall with the tenant mix and uh, footfall system, to a department store, to community shopping mall, to lifestyle now, which is the growth. You will find the, the major fact. Number one, all those changes never happen because the developer want to do that. It's happening because the urban planning, it's having demand of the customer, the trend of the customer, the age of the customer, the demographic of the customers. A city like Dubai, where the tourism are higher than other cities in the GCC, you could find the layout and the tenant and the, 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 the format of the shopping mall is totally different in the past, in, maybe in Saudi or in Kuwait. So what exactly we are seeing, we as a developer in the, in the industry of shopping mall, we always look for the function and for the demographic and the trends. Uh, in the past, people, they go and build those gigantic buildings like uh, Dubai Mall, uh, Mall of Emery, 300, 406,000 GLA, and uh, fill it with all type of brand and retail. In the past, maybe 10 years ago, you'll find the ratio of the F&B and entertainment that time never goes more than 10, 15. We are now seeing format that it goes to 37 and 40 percent of F&B and entertainment. It's because the trend, because the customer change, the customer ready to eat out, the customer ready to entertain out, the customer the want to be outside, so you're going to build what customer they need. So that's in terms of design and building your mall according to your uh, customer surrounding your project. Number two, retailer also evolve. Uh, if you remember the big size of the clothes and the uh, flagship store and that retail and now they merge together between offline and online uh, sales. And here maybe later on one of the gentlemen could tell me, is the customer who buy from both offline online considered loyal or extra loyal from a customer who just buy directly from the offline brick and mortar? That's an issue that need to be discussed. But anyway, the trend, the retailer in themselves had been changed. The size of the store had been changed. The size of the restaurant and coffee shop had been changed. 
the open space, the filters, the small space, uh, the congestivity, the, the, even the, the quality of the different uh, menus and products. And this is all had been observed by all the developers. Smart developer always sit and listen to his customer. And the, his customer is in, in two sides. His retailer are the customer or his FMB provider is customer. And also do his analysis on talking to his visitors and doing all the customer profile analysis and I think give you an example. A city like Jeddah, if you do five years ago the customer profile malls, you could save almost 95% between local and resident in the city. If you do today the customer profile of the city, or sorry, the shopping mall, something like the Red Sea Mall, and this has happened three months ago, we dropped to 80% local versus 20% uh, tourist. The country is open, tourists are visiting, so accordingly, your tenant mix and your food and your beverages have to accommodate to those visitors and tourists coming to you. Again, technology, big enabler. Uh, I am one of the people that believe technology will never kill shopping mall, actually will improve shopping mall business, where you will find now most of the retailer and developer, hand to hand, they are sharing data we just signed with the, the retailer GBT in, in one of our malls in Jeddah called the Cornish Centers to do a pilot test how to use IIA in our uh, client and how to boost business and how to get data and sharing data to build it with the rest of it. So trend is changing, definitely. Customer is changing, definitely. People, they work, women, they work, women, they drive. Now in Saudis, we used to have a problem of parking. Now it tripled the problem of parking with the women driving in the market. So you cannot predict the change happening. And I think change will happening now by tourists are increasing in the country and it will add all things. The most important thing is a developer with a retailer could adopt to this change by keep changing the things. If anybody remember uh, Dira City Center 25 years ago, it's not Dira City Center today. Neither from the tenant, neither from the parking size, neither from layout, number of hotel, number of office towers on that. It changed. And it changed because the customer is changing and the, the demand is different change. And this is what's happening now in many shopping malls around the regions, especially in Saudis. Uh, customer, uh, the dialogue with customers it has to be improved better uh, from two sides. We need the data from our uh, retailer and service provider in our malls, besides the direct data from our footfall and, and analyzing things. But what we noticed recently, the experienced uh, trip to a mall is, is not, not anymore as it used to be just a shopping. It's a more lifestyle to spend more time gathering, hanging out, Shopping is a part of it, but maybe some of the retailers now, they have the uh, click and collect uh, in their stores. And this is increasingly happening now. Even this is, you could see it now in different uh, activities in the past. We never thought this click and collect. Medical pharmacy, pharmacy now, you go to a pharmacy, you just put your card, uh, your, uh, your loyalty card, he, he will make sure the, uh, your uh, prescription and send it back to your home. You don't have to carry anything on, spend, spend time there. I saw Fox Cinema now, they do from time to time a survey to all their visitors to the, to the cinemas to know if they're looking for local versus the local, if they're looking for action versus uh, romantic. So I think working on this change is healthy. Uh, I am more optimistic about the technology, how it's going to improve our business, our panel. But uh, uh, I think the dialogue between human beings is still there. If people, they think that uh, by applying application or AI is the only way uh, to improve the business, uh, I doubt it that. It improves maybe quality of your surface, improve your productivity, improve your cost, efficiencies, control on your facility management, uh, endless. But again, the human direct 
contact between your client and uh, your customer and your visitor is very important. And I'll give you an example. Uh, when we established the YARD systems in our companies, uh, we decided to stop the communication between us and the store uh, teams. They could apply for their maintenance and all the things online. But again, we, let, we lately find that it's good to facilitate all those spending through uh, uh, application, but uh, the direct communication also, if you stop it directly between those people who provide the service in your mall, it will kill the relation between you and, and them. So that's my uh, thought about uh, technology, how important in shopping mall and trend. And the trend is changing and we are changing and let's hope we are changing for the best. Thank you, Mohammed. That was actually very interesting. So I guess our time is up. <laughs> so uh, thanks a lot for joining the panel today. I'm sure all the audience has learned a lot on navigating changing preferences. And thank you for listening. Well, thank you.